Hello, so my name is Alejandro Melendez. I am a STEM educator at the Liberty Science Center. So one of the many things that I do at the Science Center besides doing some really awesome demonstrations like blowing things up with liquid nitrogen is overseeing Liberty Science Center's marquee program, the Live From Surgery program. So the Live From Surgery program allows students to come to the Science Center uh, in order to see a live connection of a surgery being done. And not only do they get to see live surgery, but they have the opportunity to ask questions to the surgeon and the surgical team as they're performing it in real time. So the guest that I have with me is Dr. Geffner, who oversees the live from transplant surgery for the kidney. Uh, welcome and thank you for joining us, Dr. Geffner. Thank you, Alejandro. Always good to be with you and certainly always good to be with you in person. Absolutely. So as you are already used to since about 2004, right? The program's been around yes. since then? Yes. December 2004 was the first. Program. All right. So I'm sure you're already used to all the different types of questions that the students have. <laughs> so to make things interesting, um, I chose some of the greatest hits of the program this past okay. year. Okay. So hopefully you are ready for some of those uh, ho questions. Hopefully, uh, yes, I can answer the questions and uh, we won't have to play stump the band, so uh, all yes. Right. <laughs> all right, so first question that I have here is, has the COVID-19 pandemic changed the approach to kidney transplant surgery? So initially, yes. When the pandemic erupted in the New York metropolitan area in March of 2020, we actually stopped doing living donor transplants. At that point, it just we felt it was not safe to bring our uh, transplant recipients and certainly our healthy donors into the hospital at that time. Um, so we uh, basically put a moratorium on living donor transplants for about three months, then gradually ramped that uh, back up uh, with uh, obviously you know, testing of all of our donors and recipients uh, before they come into the hospital. So since about uh, July or August of 2020, we've been doing our, our you know, regular living donor and deceased donor kidney transplants at St. Barnabas Medical Center. All right, and are there any age limits in becoming an organ donor? So for deceased donation, uh, really not. Um, uh, unfortunately, there are young children that, that, that have accidents and, and can be potential uh, uh, organ donors. Um, those kidneys, even if they're very, very small, can be used in, in some of our recipients. Um, and there's really no upper age limit uh, as long as someone has, you know, good kidney function. Obviously, once we get to a 75 or 80, that, that becomes, you know, very, very questionable and there's very, very few patients that would qualify. In terms of living donation, um, there's definitely a lower age requirement, which is 18 years old. Um, you've got to be of consenting adult age in order to be a living donor. We can never have a parent uh, consent for one child to donate a kidney to, say, another child, or for a parent to consent for a child to donate a kidney to themselves. So the donor has to be at least 18 years old. Uh, recipients for, I'm sorry, uh, the upper age limit for living donation, probably around 70. Um, again, th this has got to be someone who's exceptionally healthy at age 70. Um, the joke that I used to use was uh, uh, at one point our oldest uh, living donor was about 66 years old. She rode her motorcycle to the hospital the morning of surgery. So it's that level of, of health and functionality uh, in someone who is older who is going to uh, donate a living donor kidney. All right. Uh, so you mentioned uh, about pediatric uh, patients, you know, due to unfortunate circumstances, they do pass away and you know, they have the potential for donating, but is it possible if there isn't any availability for a pediatric kidney, is it possible for a pediatric recipient to receive a kidney from an adult donor? Yes, so that's actually probably the most technically challenging thing that we do. Um, unfortunately, there are kidney diseases that can affect uh, uh, young children, even congenitally, so some children are born with kidney failure. Um, so we can transplant babies, usually we try to maintain them on dialysis until they're about one year old or about 10 kilograms, so really quite small. Uh, typically we try to transplant those babies with a living donor kidney from one of the parents. So that involves placing an adult sized kidney into a very, very small baby. Um, the challenging part of that is the kidney essentially fills the entire right side of the baby's abdomen. Uh, can compress the other abdominal contents, can press up on the diaphragm. Um, so that can be very challenging. Also, the blood vessels of the kidney are larger than the largest blood vessels in the baby. 
So we have to do some special techniques to implant the kidney um, into, that small, uh, uh, into that small recipient. But typically, again, we do use an adult kidney into a, into a baby. All right. So in the video, uh, we noticed that when you implanted the donor kidney into the recipient, um, it's in a different location. So what happens to the native kidneys that have lost their function um, when you transplant that into the recipient? So we don't remove the native kidneys when we transplant the new kidney. Those native kidneys have failed. Sometimes they are of normal size. Sometimes they have kind of shrunken or what we call atrophy over time. Uh, but with rare exception, there's no indication to remove the native kidneys. Um, so those kidneys continue to have blood supply. We don't disconnect them in any way. People have asked me that uh, over the years. Uh, and those kidneys will generally just continue to atrophy and, and ultimately not provide any function at all. And all the kidney function that the patient has will be from the, the newer transplanted kidney. All right. Uh, now, if a patient has uh, an autoimmune disorder such as lupus, uh, would they still be eligible to receive a kidney? Yes. So while there are some diseases that can recur in a transplanted kidney, the vast majority of diseases do not. So lupus, diabetes, um, you know, people that have lost their kidney due to high, uh, high blood pressure. Um, th these are things that can also be monitored and managed after a transplant. So those patients are all potential candidates to receive a kidney transplant. All right, and what is the recovery time for both the donor and the recipient? So for the living donor, that surgery is done laparoscopically, or what's now called minimally invasive surgery. Um, and those patients typically have three small incisions and one slightly larger incision, about four or five centimeters, just large enough to, to remove the kidney from the donor's body. Those patients are typically in the hospital for 24 to 48 hours, and they're back to their regular speed of activity, with the exception of strenuous activity, uh, rigorous exercise, um, uh, things like that. They, they're back to their regular speed of activity in about one to two weeks, uh, and more rigorous activity in about four to six weeks. Recipients are in the hospital for a little bit longer, that surgery is still done in an open fashion with a fairly substantial incision uh, in the lower abdomen, either the right or the left side. Those patients are typically in the hospital for three to four days, um, and that's for a combination of things. One, it's obviously recovery from the surgery. The second thing is the recipients are going to be on the anti-rejection medicines, what's called immunosuppression. So we need to kind of regulate the doses of those medicines, make sure they get the appropriate level of immunosuppression before those patients go home. So recipients typically in the hospital three to four days, Living donors typically in the hospital 24 to 48 hours, one to two days. All right, and besides taking uh, immunosuppressive medication, as you mentioned, um, are there any other lifestyle changes that the recipient must make? So there are certain dietary restrictions or, or certain other medicines that can um, um, impact the drug levels of some of the anti-rejection medicines that the patient may be on. Uh, so we counsel patients about that. Um, in terms of lifestyle, I like to tell our transplant recipients that they can resume a, a, a very active lifestyle. Uh, the best example of that is the two individuals that received kidney transplants and went back to play in the NBA. Um, so these are professional athletes that received a kidney transplant and went back to play professional sports. Um, so I like to think that our patients can, you know, can resume very active lifestyles after transplant. The goal of the transplant obviously is to um, you know, save someone's life and, and obviously improve the quality of their life. So we want our patients to be active after a kidney transplant. Okay, now I know during our programs you like to quiz the students about this, but I'm gonna turn it around just a bit. Um, have you had any identical twins as donor and recipient? Yes, so the reason that Alejandro, I quiz the students and Alejandro's turned it around um, is, is typically during the program um, we give a, a brief description of what rejection is, what rejection is not. We describe a little bit about why patients are on anti-rejection medicines. And then I asked the students, there's one instance uh, in which we do not need to put a transplant recipient on immunosuppression. So I can take the kidney out of the donor, transplant it into the recipient, not have to put the recipient on any immunosuppression uh, uh, afterwards. Um, and that setting is identical twins, um, because as the title suggests, those twins are genetically identical. So the recipient twin recognizes the donor kidney as if it were his own or her own donor kidney. Um, so they don't need anti-rejection medicines. So exceedingly rare. Um, I've been involved in probably three or 4,000 
uh, uh, kidney transplants over the course of the last 25 years, actually probably more than that, close to 5,000 and probably about 2,500 living donor transplants. Um, and we've seen identical twins in our program, I believe, three times. So the question becomes, why would one twin have kidney failure and the other twin not have kidney failure? Uh, so the reason for that really is some forms of kidney failure can be acquired. So the most common uh, way that that could occur would be with infection. Uh, there's certain types of infection that can cause kidney failure later in life. So it's possible that one twin came in contact with a certain infection that the other twin did not. And later in life, that you know, twin A would have uh, developed kidney failure from that infection years later. Um, the other way would be lifestyle. So uh, we know that in the United States, the most common cause of kidney failure in the adult population is high blood pressure and diabetes. Um, and these are generally conditions that uh, are, are, if not brought on, but certainly exacerbated by lifestyle choices. Poor diet, lack of exercise, overweight, smoking. So it's possible that one twin lived a perfectly healthy lifestyle, never had any kidney problems. Other twin perhaps did not live the, the best of, of, of healthy lifestyles, developed high blood pressure or diabetes and kidney failure. Um, so I've seen both of those instances in, in my career. All right. So. Uh in your time as a surgeon, um, has there been any new technology, any new advancements that has been introduced into the kidney transplant field? So the answer to that is yes. The, the most important advance uh, in the last, uh, really now almost 25 years, has been the use of laparoscopic or minimally invasive surgery for our living donors. Um, in my training and in the very beginning of my career, we used to do living donor surgery with a large incision that went underneath the rib cage, generally on the left side, sometimes the right side. Uh, sometimes we'd have to remove a rib or certainly spread the ribs. Um, and, and that was a big operation for a donor. They were typically in the hospital for, for, for four to five days. It would take them you know, five or six weeks to recover fully. Um, and that's difficult, even for people that are highly, highly motivated to donate a kidney to their family member or loved one. You know, most of our donors are young, healthy people. They've got lives, they've got families, they have work obligations. So it's hard for someone to donate a kidney and then have to recover for five or six weeks. When we transitioned to minimally invasive donor surgery, uh, really in the late 1990s is when the, the most advanced centers started doing this. Um, and we were able to now provide our donors with the option of a minimally invasive surgery with quicker recovery times, with less hospital stay, we immediately saw an increase in the amount of, of living donors that came forward uh, to donate to their, to their family members and, and other people that uh, had previously been on the waiting list. So that's clearly been the biggest advance in kidney transplant surgery. There have been attempts, myself included, uh, at converting the transplant operation, the recipient operation, into a minimally invasive technique using robotic surgery. That has had very, very limited uh, application uh, nationwide. So we're still pretty much doing our living donor recipients and our deceased donor recipient surgeries uh, in, in an open fashion with a standard, standard lower incision. All right. Um, and in the video that we all just observed, uh, we see that once blood flow is introduced to the kidney, um, you know, urine is usually immediately produced. So is there a certain amount of urine output you look for and expect the patient to have post-op? Uh, we don't really look at the urine output. Um, so a lot of our patients might make very little urine because they have kidney failure. Some patients still make some urine when they have kidney failure. Um, so we look for the urine output. Obviously, we want to see that the new kidney is, is making urine. But more importantly is the blood work, uh, what's called creatinine, and really essentially uh, our ability to measure the kidney's ability to clear toxins from the body. Uh, creatinine is one measure, potassium is another measure. So we really look at the patient's blood work on a daily basis and even long term, that's how they're followed uh, for, uh, for kidney function. All right, and also in the surgical video, uh, you mentioned the concept of a kidney chain. So in your transplant career, have you been a part of a, a chain? And if so, what was your longest chain? Uh, absolutely, so this is something that's really very, very important. Um, you know, historically, when we looked at living donation, we would think of um, you know, a blood relative donating to, to their family member. So uh, child, uh, adult child to parent, certainly siblings, um, a parent to child. Um, but as we have improved our ability to manage immunosuppression and prevent rejection, uh, we are now able to transplant patients that are not necessarily blood relatives. 
Uh, we certainly have to transplant patients that are blood type compatible and what we call a negative cross match, which is kind of a little immunologic test between the donor and, and recipient. But what that has enabled us to do is to transplant patients that are not blood relatives. So the most common thing would be spouse, husband to wife or wife to husband, uh, in-laws, cousins, aunts, uncles, close friends. This is my best friend of 30 years. He knows I need a kidney transplant, wants to donate a kidney to me. So that was kind of the first extension uh, of the way we do living donation. Uh, and then we entered into something that's called paired exchange, or as you refer to it as, as kidney chain. So paired exchange says if uh, patient A has a potential donor, um, but they're not compatible somehow, and patient B has someone that's willing to donate a kidney to them, and they're not compatible somehow, perhaps patient A's donor is compatible to patient B, and patient B's donor is compatible to patient A. So they can exchange or swap. So that was kind of the first phase of this. Um, and then over time, we realized that we could extend this into what's now referred to as kidney chain, where A gives to B, and B gives to C, and C gives to D. Um, and those can progress really for very long periods of time. All those transplants don't necessarily need to be done on the same day or at the same time. They can also be done at multiple transplant centers. So last week, we received a kidney for one of our patients from a transplant center in South Dakota, and we sent the kidney to Maine. Wow. So, and, and these, you know, th there are kind of national computerized registries that, that match patients mm -hmm. and their donors. Um, so that's kind of the, the you know, the, the extension of this now. Sometimes we do it within our own center. Sometimes we do it, we do it nationally. Mm -hmm. So, and I think that keys into your next question, um, <laughs> which is, go ahead. Uh, so you mentioned uh, all about the kidney chain. So I was wondering, uh, what was your longest chain? And I believe from what you mentioned during our program, it was also started by an altruistic right. donor. Right, so the concept of the altruistic donor is very, very important. So many times these chains can be triggered by a blood type O altruistic donor. Um, o is kind of the universal donor. So if um, uh, someone who's blood type O, well, let me backtrack for a second, what's an altruistic donor? So an altruistic donor is someone that calls up our transplant center and says, I'm a young, healthy person, pretty certain I have two kidneys. Um, I'd like to donate a kidney to somebody, but I don't know anyone that needs a transplant. Can you, St. Barnabas Medical Center transplant, find someone that could benefit from, from my kidney. So that is the altruistic donor, someone who is donating a kidney to someone that they don't know just because of their incredible willingness to help one's fellow man. Um, that altruistic donor can then trigger a long chain. We try with our altruistic donors not to just transplant one person. We try to trigger a, a longer chain. Uh, I believe our longest chain is somewhere in the 30 plus transplants now. Um, I've kind of lost track myself, to be perfectly honest. Um, it, it started out, I think, with eight or 12, uh, but then progressed over time where that chain, I, and I believe it may still be going. Um, uh, so it, it's an incredibly powerful tool to transplant more patients. And, and really, at the end of the day, that's the goal of our transplant center and all transplant centers, uh, which is to transplant as many patients as we possibly can. Um, in the state of New Jersey and nationwide, we have far more patients waiting on waiting lists for donor organs than we have available donor organs. Um, and, and that's really a, a key, key message. And it's a key message that we try to get across uh, to the students during the Live From program, uh, is that there is a tremendous uh, shortage of donor organs in this country, not just kidney, but heart, lung, liver, pancreas, um, all life-saving organs. Um, so we want our students and, and anyone watching this to certainly be aware of the situation, to think about the need for organ donation, uh, and, and to consider that uh, both in the live setting for kidney transplantation, and if God forbid someone in your family or close to you is ever in the situation of being a potential deceased donor, uh, that consent can be given for deceased donation. Um, and deceased donors are not just kidney donors. A deceased donor can donate uh, kidney, liver, heart, lung, pancreas. So that one incredible act of, of, of kindness and philanthropy can save the lives of, of several people. So that's really uh, an important take home message that we try to get across uh, to the students. Absolutely. Well, Dr. Gaffer, thank you for revisiting some of our greatest hits questions <laughs> and for your uh, time today. <laughs> 
Oh, always. Thank you very much, Alejandro. You actually didn't ask me the absolute greatest hit of all the greatest hits. Oh, absolutely. Which, which is the students that frequently ask the most common question is what happens if you ever drop the kidney? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> but, but fortunately, that has never happened, but that right, is right. the most common question uh, That's very that, true. That, that we get asked. Um, but thank you very much, um, uh, and thank all of you in the audience for, for your attention uh, and for your commitment uh, to organ donation um, and, and for the, you know, the mission of transplantation. So thank you. Thank you, doctor. And thank you all for tuning in. If you are interested in checking out more information about the Life From program at Liberty Science Center, definitely check us out at lsc.org. Thank you.